Namaste. And welcome to the first part of the fifth Adhikarna of the first Adhyaya, first Pada of Brahma Sutra. In this section, Shankaracharya and Vyasadev deal with the Sankhyas. Now, who are the Sankhyas? Well, they are the philosophical position that matter is the cause of the universe, life, God, and everything. Huh? So, these are still with us today in the form of the scientists. Maybe we should call them the Sankhyatists, <laughs> because they still believe in the same nonsense. Now, if you go looking in nature, you cannot find any instance or any evidence that non-living matter gives birth to living matter. In other words, life comes from life. We see every day. Just go to the maternity ward of any hospital or if you have a, a little farm or something like that, just watch your animals. Where do the animals come from? The parent animals. Where do human beings come from? Their mothers and fathers. Life comes from life. It does not come from dull, dead, insentient matter. This is our everyday experience. But why do the Sankhyas theorize, or the scientists theorize, that insentient matter can give rise to sentient life? Well, it's because they're atheists. They're rascals. They don't want to follow any authority. They don't want to have a higher source of knowledge. For example, God. <laughs> They want to follow their own human intelligence and do whatever they like. This is the disease that makes life suffering. Because why? We also find from experience that if we cultivate God consciousness in any form, through any religious or spiritual process, our quality of life improves. I had a great example of that just this morning. Finally, the hot weather has broken. There's a cyclonic storm in the Bay of Bengal, and we're getting waves upon waves of rain after months and months of drought. And it's a wonderful uh, relief from the intense heat. So anyway, I got up at like 2 o'clock this morning, it's now 4.30. <laughs> what have I been doing? Well, besides, you know, taking a shower and having a cup of tea, chanting japa of my mantra, Aum Namah Shivaya. And if you chant, you can chant Aum Namah Shivaya, or you can chant any mantra that is aimed towards the supreme, the God, uh, the sentient source of life. And you will find that you wake up. Your mind becomes active and focused and calm. And you're able to understand so many things that you can't understand as long as the mind is running here and there in pursuit of desires. So this is a perfect example. If we cultivate consciousness of God, in any form or through any means. It improves our quality of life, our quality of consciousness. And consciousness is the sine qua non. It is the prime factor that distinguishes life from non-life. And also there are so many corollaries. 
like the ability to reproduce. Therefore, sex is worshipped as kundalini shakti in the Vedic tradition and through the process of tantra. So we can understand through all of this knowledge that the sentient source is the basis of all life. So therefore, the Brahma Sutra, and of course Shankaracharya's commentary on it, go to great lengths to defeat the atheistic point of view that life comes from matter. And we're about to begin the introduction, where Shankaracharya summarizes the purports of the previous sutras, and then he goes on to give a capsule description of the Sankhya philosophy. So, let's begin. Topic 5. The First Cause Possessed of Consciousness Thus, it has been said that the Upanishadic texts are meant for imparting the knowledge of Brahman, that when their meaning is fully ascertained, they have the self, which is Brahman, as their fullest import, and that they culminate in the knowledge of Brahman even without any connection with an action. It has also been said that the omniscient and omnipotent Brahman is the cause of the origin, continuance, and dissolution of the universe. But the Sankhyas and others hold the view that a pre-existing entity can be known through other means, apart from the Upanishads. Inferring Pradhan, primordial nature, and other entities as the source of the universe, they construe the texts of the Upanishads as pointing to these only. They also think that in all the Upanishads dealing with creation, the cause is sought to be presented through the effect with the help of inference. They further hold that the contacts between the sentient souls, Purushas, and Pradhan can always be inferred. Again, from these very texts, the followers of Kannada infer God as the efficient cause and the atoms as the material cause. Similarly, there are other logicians, for example, Buddhists and others, who stand up here in opposition with garbled quotations and sophistry as their mainstay. That being the case, the teacher Vyasa who is versed in the valid imports of words and sentences, refutes the diverse ideas based on garbled quotations and sophistry by placing these in opposition, so as to prove that the texts of the Upanishads aim at imparting the knowledge of Brahman. So, thus far, the Brahma Sutras have declared that the scriptures, and specifically the Upanishads, are the prime source of knowledge of Brahman. Brahman being defined as Janmad Yasya Yataha, the source of everything, the cause of all creation, the root of all consciousness and meaning. Now, of course, these atheistic people are going to come and try to defeat this. And they have many sophisticated arguments based on sophistry. What is sophistry? It means false logic. Misusing and abusing logic to come to false conclusions based on atheistic bias. Because they hate the idea of God. They hate the idea of a supreme authority. And especially, they hate the idea that God can be sentient, that God is alive, conscious, aware, and can have agency and action and create everything by pure will and intelligence alone. This is wonderful. Uh, this is a source of bliss to the devotees. But to the atheists, they are horrified because it means, ultimately, that their false egos are illusion. 
So, of course, they have to give up their false egos anyway at the time of death. Huh? But they're not going to go down easily. They're going to fight, kicking and screaming until the very end. And we see this actually in life, that people who are materialistic, who view the whole creation as nothing but a machine, an insentient robotic thing, <laughs> fight and argue and resist death until the very last moment. And they often they will bankrupt themselves and their entire families by extreme medical interventions that do nothing but prolong their agony. This is foolishness. Huh? And the scientists are very proud of this. Oh, we have invented intensive care. All that means is that they are fighting against death. But death is inevitable. doesn't matter how much technology or how many machines you have. It's still going to happen. It happens to everyone. Why? Because that which has a beginning also has an end. This is the law of nature, the law of God. You cannot get around it. Because that which has a beginning is relative and conditioned, and it is also material, insentient, and mechanical. Therefore, eventually it's going to wear down and break, and it's going to stop performing its functions. And at that time, the life, which is the soul, the living entity, the being, the individual, the subtle body, will separate from the gross body, and it falls down dead. So we have to understand, as theistic people, there are many atheistic arguments that are sometimes very sophisticated and can be used to shake our faith and pollute our understanding of the actual truth. The actual truth is that Brahman, or God, or even beyond God, is the actual source, the actual cause, the actual creator of everything. And that to cultivate awareness of Brahman, by any means, is noble and elevating and ultimately liberating for the conditioned souls. And that this alone is the cure for the suffering of life, which ends in death. Because death is absolute. Death is predetermined by the fact of one's birth. That's why astrologers, for example, can make a chart at the time of birth that predicts the time of death quite accurately. Of course, other things can intervene. If a person lives a very sinful life, they can die sooner. Or if they live a very pious existence, full of puja and meditation and worship of God, they may live long beyond their allotted lifespan. And why is this? Well, it's discussed later on in Brahma Sutras that if one is given a mission by God to spread the knowledge, the truth that leads to self-realization, that he will not die until his mission is complete. Doesn't matter whether other people try to take him down or defeat him or argue against him, or it doesn't matter because the ultimate controller is the Lord. And the Lord is simply a manifestation of Brahman. So this commentary, this literature, this Shariraka Bhasya of Shankaracharya gives the secrets, gives the understanding of Brahman, gives the knowledge by which we can approach final enlightenment and complete liberation. Aung Tat Sat. 
ओम शक्ति ही ओम ओम नमः शिवाय